<laughs> what up guys it's Carl I'm going to read some books uh, let me see 745 yeah I could have watched some TV with my family uh, they are all in the living room I could you know scroll on social media I could have gone out to ride my bike I could have gone get a massage I could do so many things but I chose to read books because I just wanna get more knowledge I wanna have more clarity about life and the world honestly it is very difficult this book is very difficult to understand for me um, like after I read it I just couldn't really summarize it with my own words if I ask myself but anyways I read it last night the rule number two I want to read the rule number three okay I spent more than two hours reading this book today and I was like reading the rule one and trying to understand more but I definitely need to go back and spend more time just thinking and reading all right so page 67 rule three make friends with people who want the best for you the old hometown the town I grew up in had been scraped only 50 years earlier out of the endless flat northern prairie Fairview Alberta was part of the frontier and had the cowboy bars to prove it the Hudson Bay Co department store on Main Street was still bought beaver wolf and coyote 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 first directly from the local trappers 3,000 people lived there 400 miles away from the nearest city cable TV video games and internet did not exist it was no easy matter to stay innocently amused in Fairview particularly during the five months of winter when long stretches of 40 below days and even colder nights were the norm the world is a different place when it's cold like that the drunks in our town ended their sad lives early they passed out in snowbanks at 3 in the morning and froze to death you don't go outside casually when it's 40 below on first breath the arid desert air constricts your lungs ice forms on your eyelashes and they stick together long hair wet from the shower freezes solid and then stands on end breath like of its own accord later in a warm house when it thaws bone dry charged with electricity children only put their tongues on steel playground equipment once smoke from house chimneys doesn't rise defeated by the cold it drifts downwards and collects like fog on snow-covered rooftops and yards cars must be plugged in at night their engines warmed by block heaters or oil will not flow through them in the morning and they won't start sometimes they won't anyway then you turn the engine over pointlessly until the starter clatters and falls silent then you remove the frozen battery from the car loosening bolts with stiffening fingers in the intense cold and bring it into the house it sits there sweating for hours until it warms enough to hold a decent charge you are no you are not going to see out of the back window of your car either it frosts over in november and stays that way until may scrapping it off just dampens the upholstery then it's frozen too 
Late one night going to visit a friend I sat for two hours on the edge of the passenger seat in the 1970 Dodge Challenger, jammed up against a stick shift, using a vodka soaked rag to keep the inside of the front windshield clear in front of the driver because the car heater had quit. Stopping wasn't an option. There was nowhere to stop. And it was hell on house cats. Felings in Fairview had short ears and tails because they had lost the tips of both to frostbite. They came to resemble art arctic foxes, which evolved those features to deal proactively with intense cold. One day our cat got outside and no one noticed. We found him later, fur frozen fast to the cold heart back door cement steps where he sat. We carefully separated cat from concrete, with no lasting damage, except to his pride. Fairview cats were also at great risk in the winter from cat cars, but not for the reasons you think. It was an automobile sliding on icy roads and running them over. Only loser cats died that way. It was cars parked immediately after being driven that were dangerous. A frigid cat might think highly of climbing up under such a vehicle and sitting on its still warm engine block. But what if the driver decided to use the car again? Before the engine cooled down and cat departed, let's just say the heat seeking house pets and rapidly rotating radiator fans do not coexist happily. Because we were so far north, the bitterly cold winters were also very dark. By December, the sun didn't rise until 9.30 a.m. We trudged to school to the pitch black. It wasn't much lighter when we walked home, just before the early sunset. There wasn't much for young people to do in Fairview, even in the summer, but the winters were worse. Then your friends mattered, more than anything. My friend Chris and his cousin. I had a friend at that time. We all called him Chris. He was a smart guy. He read a lot. He liked science fiction of the kind I was attracted to. Bradbury, Howling, Carla Clark. He was inventive. He was interested in electronic kits and gears and motors. He was a natural engineer. All this was overshadowed, however, by something that had gone wrong in his family. I don't know what it was. His sisters were smart and his father was soft-spoken and his mother was kind. The girls seemed okay, but Chris had been left unattended to in some important way. Despite his intelligence and curiosity, he was angry, resentful, and without hope. All this manifested itself in material form in the shape of his 1972 Blue Ford pickup truck. That notorious vehicle had at least one dent in every quarter panel of its damaged external body. Worse, it had an equivalent number of dents inside. Those were produced by the impact of the body parts of friends against the internal surfaces during the continual accidents that resulted in the outer dents. Chris's truck was the ex ex exo exo exoskeleton. exoskeleton. Of a nihilist. It had the perfect bumper stick sticker. Be alert. The world needs more alerts. The irony it produced in combination with the dance elevated nicely to theory of the absurd. Very little of that was to so to speak accidental. Every time Chris crashed his truck, his father would fix it and buy him something else. He had a motorbike and a van for selling ice cream. He did not care for his motorbike. He sold no ice cream. He often expressed dissatisfaction with his father and their relationship, but his dad was older and unwell, diagnosed with an illness only after many years. He didn't have the energy he should have. Maybe he couldn't pay enough attention to his son. Maybe that's all it took to fracture their relationship. Chris had a cousin, Ed, who was about two years younger. I liked him as much as you can like the younger cousin of a teenager friend. He was a tall, smart, charming, good-looking kid. He was witty too. You would have predicted a good future for him. Have you met him when he was 12? 
but Ed drifted slowly downhill into a dropout, semi-drifting mode of existence. He didn't get as angry as Chris, but he was just as confused. If you knew Edie's friends, you might say that it was peer pressure that set him on his downward path. But his peers weren't obviously any more lost or delinquent than he was. Although they were generally somewhat less bright, it was also the case that Edie's and Chris's situation did not appear particularly improved by their discovery of marijuana. Marijuana isn't bad for everyone any more than alcohol is bad for everyone. Sometimes it even appears to improve people, but it didn't improve E.D. It didn't improve Chris either. To amuse ourselves in the long nights, Chris and I and E.D. and the rest of the teenagers drove around and around in our 1970s cars and pickup trucks. We cruised down Main Street, along Railroad Avenue, up past the high school, around the north end of the town, over to the west or up Main Street, around the north end of the town, over to the east, and so on, endlessly repeating the theme. If we weren't driving in town, we were driving in the countryside. A century earlier, surveyors had laid out a vast grid across the entire 300,000 square mile expanse of the Great Western Prairie. Every two miles north, a plowed gravel road stretched before ever east to west. Every mile west, another traveled north and south. We never ran out of roads. Teenage Westland. If we weren't circling around town and countryside, we were at a party. Some relatively young adult or some relatively creepy older adult would open his house to friends. It would then become temporary home to all manner of party crashers, many of whom started out seriously undesirable and quickly become the, that way when drinking. A party might also happen accidentally when some teenagers on waiting parents had left town. In that case, the occupants of the cars of trucks always cruising around would notice house lights on, but house household car absent. This was not good. Things could get seriously out of hand. I did not like teenage parties. I do not remember them nostalgically. There were dismal affairs. The lights were kept low. That kept self-consciousness to a minimum. The overloud music made conversation impossible. There was little to talk about in any case. There were always a couple of the town psychopaths attending. Everybody drank and smoked too much. A dreary and oppressive sense of aimlessness hung over such occasions and nothing ever happened. Unless you count the time my two quiet, my two quiet classmates drunkenly began to brandish his fully loaded 12-gauge shotgun, all the time the girl I later married contemptuously insulted someone who, while he threatened her with a knife, all the time another friend climbed a large tree, swung out on a branch, and crashed flat onto his back, half dead right beside the campfire we had started at its base followed precisely one minute later by his half-wit sidekick. No one knew what the hell they were doing at those parties, hoping for a cheerleader, waiting for a goddote. Although the former would have been immediately preferred, although cheerleading squats was scarce in our town, the latter was closer to the truth. It would be more romantic, I suppose, to suggest that we would have all jumped at the chance for something more productive, bored out of our skulls as we were. But it's not true. We were all too prematurely cynical and were very and leery of responsibility to stick to the debating clubs and air cadets and school sports that the adults around us tried to organize. Doing anything wasn't cool. I don't know what teenage life was like before the revolutionaries of the late 60s advised everyone young to tune in, tune in turn on and drop out. Was it okay for a teenager to belong wholeheartedly to a club in 1955? Because it certainly wasn't 20 years later. Plenty of us turned on and dropped out. But not so many turn, tune in. 
I wanted to be elsewhere. I wasn't the only one. Everyone who eventually left Fairview I grew up in knew they were living by the age of 12. I knew. My wife, who grew up with me on the street our family shared, knew. The friends I had who did and didn't live also knew, regardless of which track they were on. There was an unspoken expectation of families of those who were college bound that such a thing was a matter of course. For those from less educated families, a future that included a university was simply not part of the conceptual realm. It wasn't for lack of money either. Tuition for advanced education was very low at that time, and jobs in Arbiter, Arbiter was plentiful and high paying. I earned more money in 1980 working at a plywood mill than I would again doing anything else for 20 years. No one missed out on university because of financial need in all reach Arbiter, 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 Arbiter in the 1970s. Some different friends and some more of the same. In high school, after my first group of cronies had all dropped out, I made friends with a couple of newcomers. They came to Fairview as broad borderers. There was no school after ninth grade in their even more remote and aptly named hometown, Bear Canyon. They were an ambitious duo, comparatively speaking. Straightforward and reliable, but also cool and very amusing. When I left town to attend Grandy Prairie Regional College, 90 miles away, one of them became my roommate. The other went off elsewhere to pursue further education. Both were aiming upward. Their decision to do so bolstered mine. I was a happy clam when I arrived at a college. I found another, expanded group of like-minded companions whom I whom my bear Kanyan comrade also joined. We were all captivated by literature and philosophy. We ran the student union. We made it profitable for the first time in, it, in its history, hosting college dances. How can you lose money selling beer to college kids? We started a newspaper. We got to know our professors of political science and biology and English literature in the tiny seminars that are categorized even our first year. The instructors were thankful for our enthusiasm and taught us well. We were building a better life. I sloughed off a lot of my past. In a small town, everyone knows who you are. You drag your ears behind you like a running dog with tin cans tied to its tails. You can't escape who you have been. Everything wasn't online then, and thank God for that, but it was stored equally indelibly in everyone's spoken and unspoken expectation and memory. When you move, everything is up in the air, at least for a while. It's stressful. But in the chaos, there are new possibilities. People, including you, can't harm you in with their, with their old notions. You get shaken out of your knot, your ruts. <laughs> you can make new, better ruts with people um, aiming at better things. I thought this was just a natural development. I thought that every person who moved would have and want the same Phoenix-like experience, but that wasn't always the case. One time, when I was about 15, I went with Chris and another friend, Carl, okay, <laughs> to Edmonton, a city of 600,000. Carl had never been to a city. This was not uncommon. Fairview to Edmonton was an 800-mile round trip. I had done it many times, sometimes with my parents, sometimes without. I liked the anonymity, anonymity. that the city provided. I liked the new beginnings. I liked the escape from the dismal, cramped, adolescent culture of my hometown. So I convinced my two friends to make the journey, but they did not have the same experience. As soon as we arrived, Chris and Carl wanted to buy some pot. We headed for the parts of Edmonton that were exactly like the worst of Fairview. We found the same 40th street vending marijuana providers. We spent the weekend drinking in the hotel room. Although we had traveled a long distance, we had gone nowhere at all. I saw an even more egregious, egregious. example of this a few years later. I had moved to Edmonton to finish my undergraduate degree 
I took an apartment with my sister, who was studying to be a nurse. As she was an up and out of their person. Not too many years later, she would plant strawberries in Norway and run safaris through Africa and smuggle trucks across the Tuareg menaced Sahara Desert and babysit orphan gorillas in the Congo. We had a nice place in a new high rise overlooking the broad valley of the North Saskatchewan River. We had a view of the city skyline in the background. I bought a beautiful view, a beautiful new Yamaha upright piano in a fit of enthusiasm. The place looked good. I heard through the grapevine that Edie, Chris's younger cousin, has moved to the city. I thought that was a good thing. One day, he called. I invited him over. I wanted to see how he was faring. He how how he was faring. I hoped he was achieving some of the potential I once saw in him. That is not what happened. Edie showed up older, bolder, and stooped. He was a lot more not doing so well young adult and a lot less youthful possibly, possibility. His eyes were the telltale, telltale red slits of the practiced stoner. Edie had taken some job, lawn mowing and casual landscaping which would have been fine for a part-time university student or for someone who could not do better but which was wretchedly low-end as a career for an intelligent person. He was accompanied by a friend. It was his friend I really remember. He was spaced. He was baked. He was stoned out of his gourd. His head and our nice civilized apartment did not easily occupy the same universe. My sister was there. She knew it is. She'd seen he, this sort of things before, but I still wasn't happy that Edie had brought his character into our place. Edie sat down. His friend sat down too. Although it wasn't clear he noticed, it was tragic comedy. Stoned as he was, Edie still had the sense to be embarrassed. We sipped our beer. Edie's friend looked upwards. My particles are scattered all over the ceiling. He managed. Truer words were never spoken. I took Edie aside and told him politely that he had to leave. I said that he shouldn't have brought his useless bastard of a companion. He nodded. He understood. That made it even worse. His older cousin Chris wrote me a letter much later about such things. I included it in my first book, Maps of Meaning, The Architecture of Belief, published in 1999. I had a friend, he said, before anyone with enough self-contempt that they could forgive me mine. What it was that made Chris and Carl and Edie unable, or worse, perhaps unwilling to move or to change their friendships or improve and improve their circumstances of their life? Was it inevitable, a consequence of their own limitations, nascent illnesses, and traumas of the past? After all, people vary significantly. In ways that, in ways that seem both structural and deterministic. People differ in intelligence, which is in large part the ability to learn and transform. People have very different personalities as well. Some are active and some passive. Others are anxious or calm. For every individual driven to achieve, there is another who is indolent. The degree to which these differences are immutably part and parcel of someone is greater than an optimist might presume or desire. And then there is illness, mental and physical, diagnosed or invisible, further limiting or shaping our lives. Chris had a psychotic break in his 30s after flirting with insanity for many years. Not long afterward, he committed suicide. Did his heavy marijuana use play a magnifying role? Or was it understandable self-medication? Use of physician prescribed drops for pain has, after all, decreased in marijuana legal states such as Colorado. Maybe the pot made things better for Chris, not worth. Maybe it eased his suffering instead of exacerbating, exacerbating his instability. Was it the nihilistic philosophy he nurtured that paved the way to his eventual breakdown? Was that nihilism in turn a consequence of genuine ill health? 
or just an intellectual rationalization of his one willingness to dive responsibly, responsibly into life. Why did he, like his cousin, like my other friends, continually choose people who and places that were not good for him? Sometimes when people have a low opinion of their own worth, or perhaps when they refuse responsibility for their lives, they choose a new acquaintance of precisely the type who proved troublesome in the past. Such people don't believe that they deserve any better, so they don't go looking for it. Or perhaps they don't want the trouble of, of better. Freud called this a uh, repetition compulsion. He thought of it as an unconscious drive to repeat the horrors of the past, sometimes perhaps to formulate those horrors more precisely, sometimes to attempt more active mastery, and sometimes perhaps because no alternatives bacon. People create their words with the tools they have directly at hand. 40 tools produce 40 results. Repeated use of the same 40 tools produces the same 40 results. It is in this manner that who, those who fail to learn from the past doom themselves to repeat it. It's partly fate. It's partly inability. It's partly unwillingness to learn, refusal to learn, motivated refusal to learn. All right. What amazing story, man. I just know that the environment, whether geographic or cultural environment, plays a really important character, belief shaping role. I was very fortunate. I grew up in Shantan, China which is very small city, but we do have, I believe 600,000 people, similar to Seattle, but we are very like urbanized place. We are living in a very small city, very crowded in some places. So I was exposed to a lot of bad stuff. I exposed to like violence, just drugs, stuff like that. And, but later I went to United States. I lived in Seattle. What I'm trying to say is, it is a very complicated it is very complicated package that we got passively delivered to. When we were born as a kid, we didn't have the right to choose where we were born, who we were born, and stuff like that. But later, when we grew up, we have the rights to change everything that was shaped into us. We do have this power, but not many people realize that and believe it. And even less people actually can change that. But I am one of them who transformed my life. Anyway, I'm going to sleep. Thank you for sharing your time with me. Have a good night. Bye.